It's great to be with you all, to be with fellow Terps. And uh, to give you a little bit of background around this topic is, as Megan said, I've worked with a lot of leaders around the world. And sometimes we get to the point where they're like, hmm, I'm not sure this job is still for me. And uh, one of the things we talk about is before you decide to go to a different job, maybe there's things you can change about your current job so that you'll come to love. And we start with that. And if that doesn't work, then we move on to listing, to letting go of that job and looking at some other job that might be even better. And of course, we that takeoff of this name comes from the TV show, Love It or Listen, about apartments, same kind of thing. You might have an apartment that you're living in and you learn to, to love it by making some changes to make it even more enjoyable, or you decide to uh, say, this apartment's not for me, I need to move on and go somewhere else. So we're taking off on that uh, TV show name with this title, Your Job, Love It or List It. So speaking of jobs, you might be in a job now and you might think about your job and have some feelings about it. So just like Megan was asking to put your location in the chat, I'd like you to share right now how you feel about your, your current job. If you could put in the chat how you're feeling about it, some words that might describe it. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Is it challenging? Is it enjoyable? Is, does it frustrate you? I'd like you to put some of those words in the chat, some of your feelings about your current job. And I'm gonna ask Megan to share some of those uh, with us so we can hear where we are as we start off this webinar. So Megan, is, are people sharing their feelings in the chat? Yes, we have some that might be looking for jobs, unemployed. We also have, it has run its course, not a good fit. I'm waiting for other people to, to chime in. So, so interesting, but unpredictable hours in work itself. We have people transitioning after 27 years, bored, frustrated with startup environment, trying but discouraged. Feeling like I accepted a job that's below my experience level. The company's culture and approach making my makes my job frustrating before getting let go. Great. Well, thank you so much for all of you that shared and Megan for reading that. So what we're answering here is what does it feel like your job right now? What does your job feel like? And people have shared a lot about where they are in their career journey. So thank you for sharing that. And just for simplification sake, I think there's two ways you might feel about your current job. One is it could feel overwhelming. Like we have in this picture here, perhaps it's overwhelming in that it's uh, acrimonious when you go to work. Perhaps it's overwhelming and you might have feel like you're out of your depth or it might be overwhelming in terms of your workload. There's lots of ways it could feel overwhelming. Then again, for simplification's sake, maybe you're at the other end of the spectrum where it's underwhelming, where maybe you're not feeling challenged, where it's dull, you're not feeling fulfilled. So that could be ways that your current job or career is underwhelming like the people in this picture here. And so what can be done? As we talked about it, you could decide to love it. You could make it a better job where you're working right now. You could make it more enjoyable, more fulfilling, more satisfying. And after that, you could perhaps think about listing it, moving on to a different job if you weren't able to shape it into the type of experience that you'd like. So to tell you a little bit more about my background, Megan was kind enough to, to share. So I'm the CEO of the Leadership Coach Group, and we provide a variety of services, including leadership coaching, leadership assessments, leadership training, things like that. And so we're happy to, to provide you some support. At the end of this webinar, I'll be sharing a special offer of how you can get some free coaching from me about your career or anything else that you'd like. So we're hanging until then, and I'll tell you about 
how to take advantage of that. To talk about my background, you'll see in the bottom row here, uh, starts with the University of Maryland. And this foundation is what allowed me to do things later in my career. When I went to the University of Maryland at College Park, I loved my experience there. I was telling Megan and my son's now applying uh, to the University of Maryland. Hopefully he'll join the uh, Terp family. Several generations in our family have gone to the uh, University of Maryland. And while I was there, I was a student of leadership. At the time we had something called the James McGregor Burns Academy of Leadership. And I had a lot of experiences there. Uh, Dr. Burns, who's uh, literally wrote the book, Leadership, and is one of the foremost scholars of leadership. Not only was the academy named after him, but he was actually the visiting scholar and lived in my dorm uh, while I was on campus. And so I could take his classes, I could slip my papers under his door at night. I got to go to lunch and dinner with Dr. Burns. And uh, to tell you how eminent he is, I'm now doing my PhD in leadership and still citing his work. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity that uh, Marilyn gave to me to, to interact with him and also his colleague, Georgia Sorensen, who headed the center and was a scholar in her own right and founded the International Leadership Association at University of Maryland. That's now a global leadership association. And I was also the student regent on campus. So I in, represented the students at College Park and the other universities across the state. I was appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate and uh, represented 130,000 students across the state. From the University of Maryland, I asked Dr. Burns, hey, where should I go next? Continue my study of leadership. He suggested that I go to the Harvard University to the Kennedy School, so I did that. And I studied there with another leadership scholars named Ron Heifetz and um, also did my master's thesis project with uh, Dr. Heifetz. And I got my master's in public administration. And as I mentioned now, I'm at another University of Maryland school, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, where I'm working my PhD in organizational leadership. So this foundation of education, starting with the University of Maryland, allowed me to have these other successes in my life where I worked at the White House where I led a national gun violence reduction initiative. Uh, then later I worked at the FBI where as the global chief of internal communications, where as part of Bob Mueller's office when he was the FBI director, as part of the director's office and my team and I, we supported uh, Bob Mueller and how to communicate with the FBI's workforce around the world. And I also coached him and his senior leadership team on how to be better communicators. I would prepare Bob Mueller for his town hall meetings that we would broadcast around the world. And then also I was asked again to lead a uh, turnaround effort and uh, with the most violent cities in the country. So I led that effort and my team and I, we would fly into those cities and help turn them around. We had FBI agents, ATF agents, US Marshals and top criminal justice researchers trying to help those police chiefs and the mayors turn around cities such as Detroit, Chicago and um, Camden, New Jersey. So that was a great experience that I had at the FBI. I also served as a deputy chief knowledge officer, uh, which I could talk about later. And uh, it was great, great experience. Later on, I decided to, to leave government and take some of the things I did, whether it was coaching leaders, how to be more effective in their communication or developing my own employees and team members. And then I decided to become an executive coach. And as Megan mentioned, I've coached over 150 leaders on five continents, generally executives, CEOs uh, at that level is how I'm serving now. And the types of services our company mentioned, it can do the one-on-one -on -one coaching, we do team effectiveness, we do team coaching, we also do leader assessments, inspirational speaking. And here's some of the companies that our coaches have worked with. Most of the companies on this screen, I personally coach leaders. So at places like Microsoft, at the Department of Homeland Security, Salesforce, the US Army, Amazon, Sony, Kaiser Permanente, FICO, and Google, 
and the American Heart Association. I've coached leaders at all those companies. So as I mentioned, when we're thinking about your job, and I've worked with these leaders in these companies, when they've been thinking about their career and their job, the first thing we say is, before you just change jobs, think about is if you've gone from job to job to job, that's why I put in process, you're changing jobs again. And you've had the same kind of experience, but they've been unsatisfying, or you haven't had the growth opportunities that you want. Then think about what's common across all of your experiences. It might be you. That might be the common denominator in all those experiences. That's why I tell my clients, look in the mirror first and say, should I change something about myself in the way I show up as a leader in my company? That's the first thing to think about. Some of us might have had different relationships. I'm gone from marriage to marriage to marriage. And also think what's the common denominator if those don't succeed the way we'd like. So let's take a good hard look in the mirror and say, is there anything I can change about my current job? Is there anything I can change about the way I show up as a leader in my company? And that might change my experience. So that's the love it. So option one that we have in this webinar is to look at your current career, your current job and learn to love it by taking responsibility for your career. Because this is something that I call the principle of mutuality, is that if you make the effort to love your job, then your job's gonna love you back, most likely. There's exceptions to that, but if you put in the effort to make your job enjoyable, if you bring your whole self to work, then most likely your job's gonna love you back. So that's the first principle I wanted to share. I want to pause here, Megan, and to say, does this resonate with folks? Have they found when they put that extra effort, when they look at improving their skill set, has that affected their experience at work? So if you want to share your experiences, you can put that in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. So what's your experience about taking ownership of your career? Have you been able to affect your career and your trajectory and how you experience your time at work? Anything in the Nothing chat? Nothing chat yet. I'll let people type out. They might still be typing, but as things pop in, I'll be sure to read them out loud. All right, thank you, Megan. So how do you know what to do about your job? Here's some things you can do is really focus on what do you want? What would you like to see in your career? And getting some real clarity about that, that's the first step. What are you looking for in your career? What are you looking for in your job? What would be fulfilling? So think about those things that you want in your job and then identify what gaps there might be. What is the gap between where you are now and where you'd like your job to be? I think people are thinking really hard. We still don't have anything in the chat yet, but I'll let, I'll let people take their time. <laughs> okay. And once you've identified what you want and what that gap is, then the key is to take responsibility. You'll see I hyphenated, it's not a typo, responsibility. I got that from Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, is taking responsibility means you can respond to that reality. You have the ability to change your experience if you seize that opportunity. There's been a lot of research is if we feel disempowered, if we feel like we can't change, if we believe that, then that will probably be true. We if have you to... believe that you can change things, you have the ability to respond to your conditions and to affect your job, then that will also be true. 
Megan, you were going to say something? Yeah, so we have some comments here. We have Michael who said, I think it makes sense when an individual can organically grow that love. If it feels forced, then the sustainability might not be there over time. Then we had someone say, I've tried this and it does work, but it's hard to maintain. Like, things seem to fall back to where they were, and it's a tough cycle. Caitlin says, in my experience, loving your job allows my employer to exploit my work. Then Phyllis says, loving what I do or did did not have the effects you have stated. Okay. So some mixed, mixed things, but talking about sustainability, potential exploitation, and, and the tough cycle. Okay. So we're going to talk about how to address all those things. Thank you so much for sharing those because you can have uh, loving it like with, with blinders on and not trying to change your environment. And then all those things can happen. I also heard that it's hard to sustain. So we'll we'll address those things. Those are great things to, to discuss. So thank you for sharing those. So what might be on your list that makes you happy at work? Here's some things that are pretty common that I hear from clients and also the research shows us that employees are looking for. So one might be work-life balance. Having just gone through the pandemic, a lot of people were re-examining, am I feeling fulfilled in my career? And then you might have heard of the term, the quiet resignation, because people are finding, hey, my job isn't what I want it to be. And it's a really tight labor market right now. So if you're thinking about moving, you're going to have that advantage because there's more jobs than people that can fill those jobs in general in the United States. So you can look for these things or you can negotiate to have them in your current job. So work-life balance is something a lot of people are looking for. And also because of the pandemic, many of us, if not all of us, worked from home for a period of a year or two and they might wanna keep doing that, at least hybrid part of the time. And that might be something else you're looking from your employer. Some, some executives are saying, well, I don't care, pandemic's over, get back in the office. Um, in fact, we've had some clients that have that perspective and we had to talk with them about what their workforce might want. So that's something that you might be looking for. You also might feel there's a gap. Remember we're talking about what you're looking for, what might be a gap is a sense of purpose and impact. You might feel like, well, well, what's this job all about? Why am I doing this job? Am I doing good in the world? Or you might feel, hey, I believe in my company, I believe in what we do, but in my personal role, I don't feel like I'm having impact. You also might be looking for a promotion and growth opportunities. You might say, I, I don't see where this job's going to, you know, I'm going to have more opportunities as company. Or you might have been passed over for promotion a number of times. Or you might feel like your boss micromanages you. Right before uh, Megan and I got on this webinar, I was talking with a company in the DC area that has uh, one of their leaders that's micromanaging. And they're like, we know that needs to change because the people aren't happy. So you might be looking for that more autonomy because you have a boss like that, that's micromanaging. You don't feel like you can do what you think needs to be done to accomplish your organization's mission or to serve your customers well. So you might be looking for more autonomy, or you might be looking for connections at work. You might say, hey, um, I want to have some friends at work. I don't feel that connected to the people I work with. These are just some of the many things that you might have identified that you're looking for in work. Let's say that there's a gap between what you're looking for and what your experience is. So what can, what can be done about that? So when there's that gap, we can decide to take action. We can act because action Moving into a, a place of space of believing that you can have impact, whether it is reshaping your current job or looking for somewhere else, taking that action empowers you to change your reality. It changes things, as you see in this graphic, by you acting and believing in your ability to affect your world and your experience of the world. So what are some things you could do to change your experience at your work? The first thing is to talk with your manager. Now, when I work with clients, we, we game out how to approach 
their managers that they're more likely to be successful. When you're pitching a change, you could go and say, this is what I want. This will make me happier. That's one way you could frame it for your manager. Perhaps a more effective way to frame it for your manager would be, this is how I can create more business value. This is how I can make your life easier if you gave me this opportunity, if you gave me this type of special assignment, if you gave me some more autonomy, if you allowed me to work from home, I'd spend less time commuting and more time being able to work on the business. So when you approach your manager, think about how you can frame it in such a way that it's a win for them and for the business. That might help you be more persuasive. You could also mention how to make you happier. That would be to be assumed. That's why you're bringing it up. But think about how does it create more business value, more of what your manager might be. The second thing we have up there is to volunteer for special projects. If you think the work you're doing is not challenging or not leading to promotion or new opportunities, then you can volunteer for cross-cutting projects that will give you exposure in other parts of the business or to more senior roles, or to other people that could potentially hire you in that existing company. You can vote, or it might show that you have leadership ability. Maybe in a, in a role you have now, you're not, it's not allowing your light to shine, to show all that you're capable of, but you could volunteer for a special project that would show your capabilities. You can also connect up with colleagues that other people in the business that could give you opportunities. You could ask for advice from people you know that have been promoted or been able to fill the gap between what they want and where they are now. You could ask them, how did they do that? That you might replicate the process that they follow. Perhaps you put in yourself for a promotion package, but your package hasn't been persuasive, but one of your colleagues has, and they can share the template or examples of how they were able to be successful and maybe you shape, shape your package that way, or you pitch your request for a promotion or a salary increase the way that they were successful. So connecting with colleagues can be really helpful. You could also make sure you get a mentor in your existing organization or outside your organization. A mentor can advise you on ways to do things differently. And if that mentor should be someone that is um, more skilled in an area you want to grow in uh, and cares about you as a person so you can be um, vulnerable with them and ask them for something. Usually if you have a good relationship with your mentor, you can leverage then not only your network, but your mentor's network. So they might say, you know, I can't get you into the CFO's office where you want to work, but I know someone in the CFO's office and you can use my name to talk to that person. So your mentor, you can leverage that mentor's network. If you need to level up your skill as a leader or you want to, your effectiveness and how you show up, then a coach like me or the coaches in our company, the leadership coach group could be really helpful. You can invest in your ability to be more successful and then you can demonstrate that you're growing in the years. Maybe you had some gaps that were identified in your performance review or maybe people were saying, I need you to see you being an acting supervisor before you can put you in a supervisor role. And you wanna make sure when you do that, you're successful or you're going to, from director to vice president and you wanna be successful. An executive coach can be really helpful in that so that you, when it's, it's showtime, you're gonna be able to be really effective. You can also enroll in training. Sometimes you might ask your boss, hey, what would it take for me to get a promotion? What would it take for me to get to the next level? And don't be defensive if they say you have a gap. It's great to know that. And then you might talk with them. How can I fill that gap? Can I enroll in some training? Can I get a special assignment? Can, I, can you give me some opportunities to work on that gap? But training might be one of the ways to fill that gap. Or it could be a temporary duty assignment. Say, hey, can you loan me out so that I have experience? Maybe you're in the back end part of the business and you can be in the front part of the business. So you can get some 
uh, customer facing exposure. Maybe you're in a part of the business that's uh, not quite as valued as other parts of the business, and you can get a temporary duty assignment. We can move to a place where there might be more promotion potential. So temporary duty assignments is another way to do that. You can also explore other jobs at your same employer. That's another way to act because you'll have hopefully a, a really good reputation for the job you're already being doing. And then you might be able to leverage that to find other people in the company that have met you and heard about the job that you've done. So these are some ways that we can act. That when we say love your job, you can love it. These are some ways that you can be more effective so your job is more lovable. It can be um, if you've just been doing the same thing and you felt exploited, like one of the people said, maybe this will help you be more successful in asking that promotion to so not feeling exploited, but you're feeling valued and rewarded for the difference you're making because you stood up for yourself and you've been able to frame your requests in a way that makes sense for the business, and then you get that promotion. So you're feeling valued for the work you've done. For the person that says, well, maybe it's I've tried, I've started making changes, but I haven't been able to sustain it, then that's a good example where you want a coach or a mentor or an accountability partner to help you stay with the changes, to continue to with these things that are on this list here. So hopefully that addresses some of the comments we heard in the chat there, Megan. Is there anything new that's come through in the chat? Nothing now. Okay, thank you. So now if you try these things and you've given it your all and you say, okay, I've, I've loved it. I've taken love as a verb. I've acted on it. I've made some effort. I've made my approach to how I've negotiated. I've changed my approach to my job. I've tried to show up differently. I've given it a, a month or a year and it hasn't changed. If it has, great, stay where you are. It's probably the easiest thing. But if it hasn't, then that might be a time to say, okay, cross out option number one. Let's go to option number two and move on to listing it. So let's explore that. So the first thing I'd say is try to get some clarity on what you are looking for. We talked about that under option one. And one of the things I found, one time I was helping my wife, she had a variety of different job options. And we created a spreadsheet like this. Across the top in the columns are things that you might wanna be looking for. You might say, I, I want to have a certain level of salary. I wanna have a work-life balance. I want my commute to be a certain way. I want autonomy. I wanna have a sense of purpose or I might wanna have growth opportunity or it may be other things. But identifying what's important to you is really important. Now, and also if you're changing jobs, don't forget the things that might be present in your current job. It's not a given that they'll be present in whatever new job you get. So make sure to think about what are things that you like about your current job that might not be true about a job you changed to, right? The grass is always greener, but you might change jobs and say, oops, I realized there was something I valued in my last job that's no longer true in my new job. So you want this to be a really comprehensive list of what might be in these columns. And then as you explore different opportunities, whether you're looking at the job description you know, in different job postings, or you're listening to what it looks like from other people, you might then have in these rows, you might list those different jobs that you're exploring. Or if you've been really successful in this process, it might be all the different job offers you've gotten. But it's good to start as you're doing this listed process, looking for new jobs, listing your old job, saying, okay, I'm, I'm trying something new, get some clarity on what you're looking for before you jump into that process. And then how can you be really successful in your job search? <clears throat> There's lots of advice out there. I wanted to list some things that I've worked with clients on that might not always be intuitive. So this isn't a, um, a comprehensive list, but it's some things that you may or may not have thought of. 
The first one there is to activate your existing network. So you might have a network and you might be reluctant to use it. Sometimes I work with clients who are like, hey, I have a good network. I'll use it for other people. I'll use it on behalf of my mentee, but I feel awkward asking for something for myself. Uh, sometimes I hear that from my clients and I encourage them, this is a way for you to find that dream job and have that impact you want. You want to activate your network, particularly as you go up to more senior roles, having a, a really well-developed professional network will help you get those roles because usually just applying um, cold and not having any contact on the inside, it's going to be really hard to get hired. You'll be one of thousands of resumes sometimes that they'll be looking into. And if we want, if we have time later, I can share my personal experiences with things like that. So who could be in your network? It could be current friends of yours. It could be from former colleagues. I've often work with leaders, as I mentioned. So sometimes they're going to their former employees as they're trying to change jobs. Hopefully they were good leaders to employees. And they say, hey, that new company you went to, is there any openings for me at my level? No, you can have a foot in the door or it could be a former boss of yours or it could be a peer that was on your level. But former colleagues, you keep track of where they go. They might have an in that, at that company that you're targeting. And as I mentioned earlier, your mentors and their network, where they've worked or where they're working now, could also be part of your network. And there's many other ways you can build your network. But the first thing is to think about how to activate your network. LinkedIn is your friend. As if you're searching for a professional job these days, they're going to be expecting you to have a LinkedIn profile. And they want to see on your profile uh, what you've done, what impact you've had in those roles. You know, have you saved the company thousands of dollars? Have you brought in thousands of dollars of new business? How many people have you led in the past? What have been your duties? It should be filled out. Don't just list where you worked. Don't have people guess what your responsibilities are. Have a robust LinkedIn site. And depending on if it might be work okay for your employer to know, go ahead and, and change your setting on LinkedIn that you're open to work so that recruiters know that they could knock on your door and find you. And that's also why you want your profile to be robust. What are the keywords that recruiters might be looking for? Make sure that's in your LinkedIn profile. Don't have them have to guess. They might be doing word searches. So you want it to be there present in your LinkedIn profile. Also have a very professional picture as part of your LinkedIn profile. Don't have a picture of you far away or a picture of you in your car. Have a nice professional photo done. Have that as part of your profile. Smile in your picture, right? Show that you're friendly. Somebody they'd like to have as a colleague. Someone they won't have to worry about that'll show up on the HR desk as a problem later. If someone's friendly, gets along with people, show that in your picture. Something else you may not think about is having informational interviews. Um, for much of my career, I was in the government. Uh, one time I was uh, applying for a very senior job at the US Department of Homeland Security. And I was interviewing with the Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security. So I did informational interviews for people who I knew who worked in the Department of Homeland Security so I could understand what their language was, what their acronyms were. I read a book. I was uh, interviewing to be the head of uh, policy for the, the um, agency in Homeland Security. So I needed to know what the threats were. I needed to know um, how the inspector general, the general accounting office, I needed to know everything about that role so I could have that high level conversation with the assistant secretary and impress them right off. So you can have informational interviews that can help you with that. I also did the same thing when I applied to a job at Google. I did informational interviews in other parts of the company before I interviewed with a part of the company where I was applying. So those interviews can help you learn that language, help you um, know what the culture is and uh, understand what some of their challenges might be that you could address. You can also go to professional conferences 
One time uh, I was the uh, chief of internal communications at the FBI and I was at a professional meeting with other chiefs of internal communications. And I said, hey, um, you know, I'm head of communications for the FBI and I actually have job openings. I'm looking for, can anyone refer me to someone that they might know that would be good for me to hire? And as the next person going around the table, she said, hey, I'm actually looking, I'm open to changing companies. I ended up hiring her. She went through a competitive process, but I ended up hiring her and she became my successor as chief of internal communications at the FBI. So professional conferences is someplace that you can uh, network and find people in your field that are potentially looking for someone to hire or can then refer you to someone that's trying to hire. And of course, job boards can be really helpful. Um, there's lots of different ways you can get job boards. You can even just Google like, you know, IT jobs near me. Uh, I did that recently on the Gaithersburg area and it came up with all these jobs in Gaithersburg and Rockville and, and it searched all these different job boards. It's so easy to find open uh, jobs right now by using technology. You can also think if you're changing jobs, what are competitors of the company or organization I'm in right now? They'd probably value your experience. But you can look at them and say, you know, what openings do they have? Or you can pitch yourself to them. So that's that's someone else that might value and you might not think about. Those are good ways to start with your job search. And then when you get to the job interview, here's some other tips. Is those informational interviews that you've done before you're interviewing for the job you want, that will provide you the opportunity to be more successful. Because as I mentioned, I'll help you understand key issues and speak that company's language. So when I was interviewing with that Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security, I knew what some of the problems were. I knew they had just been written up as an agency of having certain gaps. So I said, I can help address those gaps that your agency's facing. Or when I interviewed to be in the um, internal communications function at Google, I had already done several informational interviews. I had interviewed other people at Google. I had watched the founders on what they had said about where Google was. I'd watched videos of them talking about their mission and what their challenges were. And I knew how to bring that up. And they were considering me for a very senior job because I could speak that company's language and knew what challenges they had and talked about how I could help fill their gaps. You can also look to make sure you have consistency between what you said in your LinkedIn profile, what you say in your interview, and what you emphasize in your follow-up thank you notes. It's great to have consistency between all those things so you're staying on message. Just as you know, I, I told you I had a background in government, that's what we learn in when you're running for office, you want to stay on message and have that consistency. And that's also what job recruiters will teach you. Have that consistency of message so it comes forth clearly for the people that are considering to hire you. And you want to practice your interview answers. There's a variety of ways you can find out what you're likely to be asked in your interview. And you want to practice short, pithy responses to those questions and you, so it's concise. And especially if you're doing for a leadership position, you want to think about examples that you might provide of how you've done that in the past. So you describe very uh, concisely what was the situation of the example you're giving, what was the action you took, and because of your action, what was the result in that situation. So that's a way to think about how you might answer things in an interview. And you can research uh, Glassdoor and there's other sites as well that reviews of the company because a interview is a two-way street, particularly in a tight labor market like this. You wanna find out not only there to give them an opportunity to see whether or not they think you're a good fit for what you're looking for, but you wanna see if you think that company is a good fit for what you're looking for. And that, that spreadsheet that we talked about before, and you can ask them questions Typically at the end of an interview, you can ask them questions and have your questions ready. Let me share you the best question I've ever heard from an applicant. I was uh, the deputy chief knowledge officer at the FBI and I was hiring unit chiefs, like subordinate supervisors. And one of the people, when we got to say, we, we had asked all our questions and we asked him and said, do you have any questions for us? 
this is the question. Now, this was for a high level position as a supervisor position, and he had an interview panel. He said, my question for you, is there anything, any doubt in your mind whether or not I'd be a great fit for this position? And if so, what is that doubt? That's an awesome question. Because he got into the heads of the interviews. We responded, the interviewee, interviewers, and we said, hey, we wonder about this. Do you have enough experience? We're wondering about this. And then he had a second chance to address any doubt in the interview panel, which is mine. And we ended up hiring him. That's the best question I've ever heard of an applicant to a job. So let's say you're successful on this. Congratulations. You've got a job out. You're not done yet. You want to think about, go back to that spreadsheet. Does this job offer meet what you're looking for? Is this the employer where you have a sense of purpose, growth, commute you're looking for, uh, autonomy? Is it, does it have it? Does it meet your criteria? Don't necessarily accept the first offer. And have in mind what your salary requirements are. That's an executive way of saying it. They, what are your salary requirements? That would mean you would accept the job. And make sure to negotiate. You don't have to take the first offer. In fact, especially in leadership jobs, I would not recommend taking the first offer. Negotiate. Show them that you believe in yourself. And you can negotiate salary. You can negotiate benefits. You know, maybe you say, I, you know, didn't, didn't, you don't want to emphasize before you know they're interested in you. You know, the ability to, to work hybrid some of the time. But now after they tell you and they give you an offer, then you can have more leverage and you can negotiate certain benefits you might have, like some work from home or um, you know more leave or something, whatever is important to you, that's when you have more leverage once they've made an offer. And if you do decide to take that job, prepare to hit the ground running. Don't just show up as you did in past jobs where you weren't satisfied. That's where that look in the mirror was really important. Think about how do I want to show up in this new job? They don't know what your reputation you have. You have a chance to start fresh. So prepare to hit the ground running. A coach can help you with that too, but make sure you start off strong in that new job. You only have once to create a first impression. So think about how do you want to show up as a leader in that new job and prepare yourself to show up that way. Depending on the level of job you're taking, uh, sometimes we're coaching people who are coming in senior vice president or CEO role. You want to spend a lot of thought on how you're showing up. When are you going to do your first all hands meeting? Uh, you know, how, how are you going to introduce yourself to other stakeholders? So depending on the role you're taking, you need more or less preparation, but it's always useful to think about coming in well prepared with a plan of how to show up successfully. Now I've gotten to the end of my prepared remarks and here's the offer that I mentioned. This is how to contact me. If you have any questions that we aren't able to address in this Q&A period, feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out to me by email. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. My contact information is there. And if you, you tell me that you heard about this offer from this webinar, then I'll give you a free coaching session. We can talk about your career, either how to make it more successful where you are or how to look for a new one. I'm happy to provide it to a fellow Turk. Here's my contact information. Megan, now I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. This was great. We already have a question in the chat, so I'll dive right into it. Courtney asks, is it best to reach out to request informational interviews through LinkedIn? LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. And so let me give you an example of how you can use that. So yes, informational interviews can be really helpful if you follow a good process. Here's a process that I follow. So I mentioned I was the chief of internal communications at the FBI, and I was at the time really enamored with Google. And I thought, hey, I'd love to do internal communications at Google. And so I applied and I applied through the front door and I said, you know, I put in my application, I heard nothing from them, from a, from a regular job posting. But I use LinkedIn and there's ways you can search. I said, is there anyone in my network 
my existing network that either works at Google or has a first order connection to someone at Google. You can search this way on LinkedIn. And I found that I had people I knew that worked at Google and I had people that knew someone that worked at Google. And then for the, I tried to get somewhat close to the part of Google because it's a really big company to where I wanted to work. And I, for those that weren't in my direct network, I asked the person that was connecting us, can you do an introduction for me to that person? And I'm not asking for a job. I just want to conduct an informational interview, like half an hour or an hour over Zoom. Could you introduce me to that person so I could ask? And I'm a known quantity or vouching for me. And so that's one way you can use LinkedIn to ask for an informational interview. Any other questions, Megan? No questions so far, but I encourage people, I'm gonna remove this spotlight um, and anybody can chime in or put a question in the chat. All right, Vincent says he has a question. Vincent, do you wanna come off mute and just ask or would you rather type it in the chat? I think you're still on mute, yeah. We'd love to hear from All you. Right. <laughs> well, while Vincent's typing, we have uh, Michael asked, how does the recent push towards ending non-compete clauses in contracts impact people currently in a position to help decide whether to go to their competition? Yeah, so uh, sometimes the non-compete clause you might get up front or you might be a part of a severance package if you're in an executive position. They might ask you to sign that, you know, you get some severance, they might ask you um, to say nothing about your previous employer. Um, so that, you know, even if you didn't leave on the best terms, so there might be sometimes conditions of severance when you leave, but certainly having a non-compete clauses going away allows you to have more opportunities to go to competitors. Does that answer the question, Megan? Yeah, that's great. We also have another question from John. During the interview process, if they ask you, what do you expect to make or need to make? What is a good way to turn it back to them? Okay, so do your homework first. That's where you can um, you can research both what the people in that general role typically make. That should be relatively easy to find by doing some research. And sometimes you can find that that specific company, they might... Um, pay above or below the typical average for that industry in that role. So you could get a sense of that ahead of time because you wanna ask something that's realistic. And I encourage you to have that number in your head ahead of time. So you don't find yourself agreeing to something that's below your value. And also if possible, it's better for them to name a number first. So you could demure a little bit and say, well, I, I hope to be paid commensurate with what would be typical for your company in this range uh, and for someone of my experience. You know, that would be a way to mirror so you can try to get them to answer first. It's mm -hmm. better if they start. Great. Vincent, are you ready to ask your question? And then Kalika, if I'm pronouncing that right, has a question as well. Okay. Hi, um, Mr. Seelman, is that your name? You can call me Michael, yes. Okay, hi, Michael. Um, one question. Um, I started posting my resume on Indeed and I wanted to, and my job history, and I wanted to do the same kind of thing on LinkedIn, but I'm concerned that um, someone might be able to use my job history, my personal information to like do identity theft or something. I guess that is possible. I don't know how prevalent that is. Um, so you might have to do a, a risk analysis, like look at cost benefit, right? <laughs> what might be the opportunity cost of not putting your information out there? Of uh, It might prevent you from being open and receiving lots of different job offers because it's a huge uh, platform for that. Um, so you have to make that, it's kind of like a coaching answer. Coaches don't tell you what to think but they might help you how to think through that process. I can right. tell you that I think the opportunity cost would be pretty large if you don't put out your experience. Thank you. You're welcome. 
All right, we have, we'll take our last question. Similar to Mark's question, are cover letters still a thing as well? Are you seeing that cover letters are still popular and people are asking for them? Yeah, so the, the content in a cover letter uh, could still be important. And so that's like thinking through, you know, what's the opportunity and how do you match the opportunity and what their needs are. So it might, that content might come through an email, it might come through a LinkedIn message, it might come through uh, in an interview, but thinking about that content that you would put in a, a cover letter is still important. And uh, it might be that you would do an actual cover letter, but that's probably less common than it's been in the past. All right. 